Welcome to the School of Bravery. My name is Emily Ann Peterson, and I am a singer songwriter and an author and a business coach and a bravery enthusiast. And I'm here today with Hannah Kyle um, of Hannah Kyle Holistics. I'm very excited to have you here. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Yay. So um, Hannah Kyle is, has been part of the School of Bravery for how long? Like about a, a year and a half, think two years almost? I think it's close to two years. Yeah. It's from the, from the, from the beginnings is great. Um, and you know, we do these featured student interviews uh, you know, from time to time, but I specifically wanted to have you on this month um, or like right now because we're on the like backside of the month of defiant expectation and we're like turning our gaze towards focusing on the ingredient of the bravery ingredient of risk. And Hannah Kyle, something that I have noticed about Hannah Kyle in the last couple years of working together is that she like part of her core is social justice and advocacy and equality and um, speaking up for difficult subjects or not difficult subjects. It might not be difficult for her. Um, we can talk about that. But I, I know that this being defiant and speaking up in, in interesting and unique ways is very much Hannah Kyle. And um, I just wanted to invite you on to talk about that kind of stuff. And the other, you know, um, reason is we're focusing on risk this next month. So Hannah Kyle is based out of New York City. And right now, at the time of recording this, New York City has had a very tough couple of months um, and is probably facing a couple more. So, um, yep. I'll let you jump in and like, what, what are your thoughts on anything that I just said? I know it's kind of, it can be kind of awkward to have somebody talk about you to you. <laughs> oh, it was fun. Fun to hear. <laughs> fun to hear. Um, let's see. Well, I'm a big fan of the school of bravery. You have really helped me build my business a lot and I can't say enough good about my experience. Um, so I'll probably, I'll probably say more good things as we go on. And Yes, New York is a mess. <laughs> uh, it's real risky here. So yeah. we are really in defiant expectation really resonates with me as a core value of New York City. And that is not the right value when it comes to uh, overcoming a pandemic. Talk to me about what do you mean by that? Oh, uh, well, to me, and the way that you describe defiant expectations and the way it relates to me personally and who I am in the world and being defiant means going against the norm or swimming upstream mm -hmm. often, or uh, like you said, saying something difficult, like pointing out the elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And um, as we have gone through this pandemic, I've continually, said, New York is not, we do not have a culture of compliance. I mean, perhaps it is the whole United States, but I've only really lived here in my adult life. Um, so I don't try to speak for anywhere else, but you know, we're supposed to stay home, but people don't always stay home. Yeah. We're supposed to wear masks, but it took a long time for New Yorkers to really embrace wearing a mask all the time, everywhere. And even when I go out, which is not very often, I still see people not wearing masks. I wish I could get in their head and understand, but I can't. Yeah. So it's interesting because there's defiant expectation. Uh, there, there's, there's a lot of defiance rather. Mm -hmm. it, it's, um, it wasn't until I moved to the East Coast recently you know, in the last, what, two, three years that, um, that I like, started traveling up to the Northeast. Um, and up until that point, I hadn't spent hardly any time in the Northeast at all. And it's, it was really fascinating to me the first time I like went into a grocery store or some like public environment 
in the Northeast and someone was, I, I just remember the person who was helping me out, like try to find the aisle with the thing that I was looking for. They were very helpful. Like at the end of the, like when all was said and done, they were very helpful, but they were also very cold about it in, mm. in comparison to the Northwest or California or the West Coast or the South or Texas or any of the other areas that I've been. And it was really interesting to me to experience that for the first time as an adult and go, oh yeah, I'm yeah. like a stone throw away from like New York City where they're like, you know, helpful, but you know. Yeah, we don't mess around really. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I think it's really admirable and, and um, the, the not messing around at least, you know, um, and, and not beating around the bush and just saying what mm -hmm. needs to be said and like moving on with your life. Mm -hmm. you know? Yes. Um, yes. Direct. Yeah. I like, I, I like being direct. <laughs> yeah. 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 So with, um, how have you seen, cause you know, like we've got the defiant part down in New York, yeah. but the expectation part is this like element, this twinkly element of hope, you know, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. have you seen that as well? Hmm. There are bright spots. Uh, it's, it's really hard to feel positive after seeing so many things go wrong and so many people yeah. suffer. Yeah. Um, I think that at this point where we are on the other side of the curve, so there's less cases of coronavirus every day. Um, less than like the last, I don't really keep track, but I recently saw less than 500, which seemed great as a, a marker of the curve going down. Um, <laughs> I, I think that we have expectations uh, that are maybe un, uh, unwarranted, like that we will get to go hang out with our friends sometime soon. I don't know. I feel yeah. hopeful that that change will continue to happen. And I think that that's the only constant, really. It's, a, it's that, old, that old saying. Yeah. Because we, this is so unprecedented. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Is, um... You know, this is just a fa fascinating thing that I've, you know, heard as, you know, being the facilitator of the School of Bravery, because I get this, like, unique perspective to, um, you know, have the ear of each of our students um, on an individual basis and then collectively as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's been really, in some cases, it's been really wonderful to hear from some of our students that have said, like, if it wasn't for joining the School of Bravery when I did like a year or two years previous, I would not be able to survive this month, like financially, like my business wouldn't be around <laughs> um, if it wasn't for the work that we have done in the last like year and a half. That's awesome. Um, yeah. So that, there's like that piece, which just feels really great to go. Yeah. Cause it, bravery is something that you build on a daily basis and mm -hmm. it's like, build up those muscles and get stronger in that, in that way. Um, the habit of bravery. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. It's a practice, but I also, you know, it's, it's been really interesting to see, you know, we've got some students who are not close at all to how this pandemic has affected their personal lives or their, you know, like their city or their local environment. And then we have, students like you that mm -hmm. it has affected everything everything um and i'm the the timing of focusing on defiant expectation this month i find being really un, really uncanny um mm -hmm. and i promise i'm circling to my question which is <laughs> <laughs> uh, um which is how have like how has all this changed that you were talking about how has all this change um and your involvement in the school of bravery how has that balanced out for you one thing that 
uh, that has been helpful for me and it seems like a lot of other people too, um, hearing what you just said is that being in community with other people um, working on their businesses or mm -hmm. trying to have a business in some way based mm -hmm. on their passions or skills. Uh, so having a community around that has been really a life-saving device. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and that just makes me think about all of the ways that community is being created here that I've witnessed in New York and in lots of other cities too, um, like all the ideas of mutual aid mm -hmm. or, or the idea of mutual aid and the application of mutual aid has really come forth in, in this time. And I think we do a fair amount of that in our, mm -hmm. in our school of bravery community um, yeah. by giving each other support and feedback and bouncing ideas off each other and mm -hmm. borrowing this and that. Yeah, it's been really, it's been really fun to see that bubble up um, mm -hmm. because I think that is a super valuable part of having a safe place to practice being brave. Um, you know, like even um, like when you're, when you're preparing to do something really exciting, um, whether it's, a positive exciting thing or a scary exciting thing um it is so helpful to have a safe like sanctuary <laughs> mm -hmm. where you know that you can like like unbutton button the top button on your pants and kind of like let out mm -hmm. some, <laughs> some belly relax air and just go like oh my gosh yes yeah you can like relax or you can feel safe enough to ask a question that you might not feel comfortable asking elsewhere or or freak out a little bit like I do yeah. sometimes <laughs> yeah <totally fine. laughs> when I can't figure something out with technology yeah that's totally fine mm -hmm. yeah it's yeah. great yeah does um let's like move move a little bit more towards risk now like when okay you know when we're doing when you're talking about community um, it, like being involved in a community like the School of Bravery ha definitely has risk. You know, you have to make that choice to be vulnerable with a group of people, even if it is safe to do so. Um, but what part of community have you seen risk play a role in New York or in the social justice work that you've done? Well, the first thing that comes to mind is in our busy lives, in our previously busy lives in New York, just showing up to something was sometimes a risk because unless you've done it before, uh, it's, it's new. It's a new experience and there's no guarantee you'll like it. <laughs> I um, specifically think about that when I think about going to dance class and how uh, sometimes I would not go to dance class because I don't know if it'll be the right style or level or if I'll like the teacher or if it will be fun for me. And there's no way of knowing until you do it. And so many things are like that. Another um, version of that is going to a concert of a band you don't know. You know, that's a risk. So a little risk or a big risk. And then more recently, let's see. There's, there's risks that I've seen people that, that I've seen people taking and people have taken for me, um, in, um, bringing supplies, you know, going, I've had friends go to the store for me and drop off some vegetables because I was sick at the beginning of April and that was a huge risk on their part and so appreciated by me. So appreciated. I don't know how I will repay them, but somehow other than with money, of course. <laughs> I, I, you know, there's anytime we, I was listening to this. Um, this is actually an article I read. No, I can't even remember where I found it. I'll have to Google. Um, 
and find it and put it in the notes. But the this really great perspective on the concept of interdependence versus independence. In Love it. The U.S. and especially during this time, and that I think is um, a, like in interdependence is something that I know that our community, the School of Bravery, really values. Um, because we are not islands. <laughs> exactly. You know, we may have our own individual unique businesses, but, or individual careers or artistic um, endeavors, but the fact that we're all doing brave things together means that we are connected to each other. Um, and that connection implies that there there could be loss. Um, like if one party loses out or has a loss or has a sad day, then that affects the rest of our group too, you know? Um, mm -hmm. So, and that definitely, I've seen that happen in, in like just an individual meeting that I have even outside of the school, just like any, any meeting you, you have like somebody who shows up and they're like, just having a day, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. and it affects how the meeting goes. Um, or yeah, yeah, we're sensitive, we're porous, yeah, we have empathy, yeah, yeah, or we don't, by one another. <laughs> or we don't, right? Yeah, exactly. We have an empathy, <laughs> or we don't, but when we do, we're more affected by the experience of one another, mm -hmm. yeah. There's and there's a lot of, of grief right now, and it's a risk to open up to that aspect of this experience. And so I think people, the more that I see people acknowledge and, you know, I see, I mean, on Facebook and Instagram and so on and so forth, but the more that I see people acknowledge the, the grief that we're all going through, I think the better. I'm not a trauma expert, but I, I have some experience and um, it's risky, well, but it's worth it to process. Yeah. And we're all experts in our own trauma. You know, True. We, all, we all understand our own trauma. Um, uh, and I, you know, if one of the things that Hannah Kyle does, which is what I think is really cool, is she, and I've seen, I've only seen pictures of her involvement of this on Instagram. Um, so I'm excited to ask you some of these questions because um, we okay. just haven't had a chance for me to go like, Tell me about this thing. Um, but you are part of this group called the Rude Mechanical Orchestra, which, right. as I understand it, does essentially helps with, is a orchestra, like a big brass band that shows up and helps with demonstrations or social justice events or, I don't know. Yeah, all the things. All the things. All the things what? that people could need help for when they are fighting for justice. Mm -hmm. So what, is, what has that looked like? Like, why would you need a big brass band for social justice? <laughs> well, mm -hmm. uh, when, uh, when there's a big march, like uh -huh. traditionally in New York City, uh, May 1st is May Day. I mean, May 1st is May Day everywhere, but traditionally in New York City on May 1st, there was a big march down Broadway. We did it for many years. Obviously, it's not happening. But when you have a big long march to do, um, and some people listening might remember marches in Washington mm -hmm. in, the, in the early 2000s, anti-war marches, big anti-war demonstrations, things like that. The band was formed around uh, 2007. No, no, no. 2004? I think it's 2004. Anyway, yeah. the band was formed around this time where there were a lot of anti-war marches and... Um, The people joining together in the marches really enjoyed the the uh, the uplift that happens when you've got some music, especially loud, boisterous, maybe slightly familiar, maybe includes a chant or some lyrics. Mm -hmm. So the band began and has morphed along the years, played different songs, has different members, um, and so in New York, we show up 
to as much as we can like marches, which is a big one because it gets tiring. I'm just going to say this quietly, but it gets a little boring sometimes. <laughs> That's my perspective. Um, and being, being with the in band, a march, like just being in a march. Just without, being in a march. Yeah, without the band. Yeah, or without puppets or without um, a drum corps or just like just people in a march mm-hmm. using their own voices. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's not enough. Yeah. Um, people come, people show up for those things for all different reasons. And one reason is, could be that they feel inspired to continue doing whatever work for whatever the cause is Mm -hmm. as a result of their experience on the march. And if their experience in the march is uh, exciting and full of music and sound and color, Mm -hmm. all the better. So, So, yeah, that's one of the ways that it happens. We also have played many, many a benefit party for um, organizations that really run the gamut, immigration, um, LGBTQIA rights. uh, I mean, uh, we participate in a lot of um, um, Mm -hmm. anti-Israel boycott, divestment, and sanctions movement. We Mm I mean, I can't even list it now. There's so many things. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's really, it's a unique um, offering that you're you're basically like, you you, sounds like you will end up becoming the pulse of whatever the demonstration is. Sometimes we want to be in solidarity. And so we really try to partner with the organization that asked us to be there and Mm -hmm. get the words that they want Mm -hmm. for the chance. Mm -hmm. And if that works somewhat, and also you'd be surprised, there may be a band in your town, you where you are or you dear listener anywhere because marching bands like this with the social justice um, angle have been, have been, uh, have been blowing up. And there's a festival called Honk um, that is not going to actually be happening this year, but will be happen- happening virtually all over the world. So awesome! something to kind and, of look forward to, even though it's yeah. different from last year. And does the, um, and f- the ones, the, I should say, the, the marches that I've been at where there have been a brass band, it looks like it's volunteer, like. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Most of and, the time, yes. Great. And then, um, so basically what I'm getting at is if you played an instrument in high school and you no longer play anymore, but you think you could play a little bit and you want to go check You can out. definitely join the Rude Mechanical Orchestra. Absolutely. Yep. Yes. Okay. And <laughs> yes. what if you don't play an instrument, but you still want to be involved? Um, send us an email. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> Cool. Sometimes we, yeah, there's, there's lots of things. So I originally joined the band as a dancer because we had a dance team of about mm, eight to 12 on any given day. And um, all of those people have moved on out of the city to different things, to different instruments. And so now I've taken up the cymbals. <gasps> we have a rhythm yes. player with us. It's awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's so super fun. fun. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Fun. Well, okay, so what kind of, you know, here we are, we're heading into this unforeseen, like, we just don't know what this next season's going to look like, and that's okay. Um, We don't have to know, Um, and we just can't know sometimes. Um, How, like, what kind of risk is involved in moving forward with, like, demonstrate, because there's stuff to demonstrate totally defiantly expectant for (laughs) yeah uh, in this season um but what does creative courage look like when you like don't want to leave home or you can't leave home or it's not safe or there's too much risk Mm -hmm. um one thing that i saw happen recently was it is part of the a campaign called let my people go and it's an anti-incarceration um I don't know if project is the right word, but Mm -hmm. basically because so many, uh, because people are so close together in prison 
and mm -hmm. often imprisoned for nonviolent uh, things. Mm -hmm. Sorry, it's not a technical term. Mm -hmm. uh, there has been a lot of campaigning to raise bail funds um, and get people out of prison that don't really need to be there, um, mm -hmm. which is another one of my values and the values that the band supports. Um, but what I wanted to talk about is some people I know and many people I don't know made this beautiful video. And probably everyone who's scrolling around on the internet has seen these piece, sort of pieced together videos of musicians playing in their own homes and then it gets mm -hmm. put together um, in Final Cut Pro or whatnot. And yeah. that is uh, like as moving as any thing that I've experienced in real life, I have found. Um, and maybe it's just that we're sensitized differently now yeah. because our <laughs> expectations are not that we're going to get to see these things in real life at the moment. But yeah. um, I thought that was a, a really fantastic way to demonstrate and raise money and raise awareness. It's going to be really interesting to see how people, you know, even even the protesters who are protesting like we the fact that we need to open up businesses and open up the stage which is like I don't agree with but um like the seeing how they have chosen to um protest in their cars <laughs> which I think is mm -hmm. ironic in and of itself but um you know or like celebrating someone's birthday um by doing a drive-by parade yeah that's um, you know, pretty sweet it's really sweet or like you know there, it's so uh, it's whether you're demonstrating like in resistance or demonstrating it's a demonstration of like love and care mm -hmm. um it's it's going to be interesting to see how um, that risk plays a role in yep. us moving forward as, as a community because we yeah. are inter interconnected so yeah and here at the very end of april we're starting to talk about how it would work to be together in public again with space with social distancing with appropriate social distancing but it's hard because our brass instruments you know they propel air with little spit molecules or whatever mm -hmm. <laughs> into the spit into the air so i i want us to be responsible yeah um, but with with such a deep level of unknown. It's, it's hard to know what the right choice is. Right. Right. Well, you know, um, I want to shift gears a little bit because one of the things that Hannah Kyle has been working on in the last two years has been mm -hmm. this wonderful thing, which I think is so exciting. Um, it's called the body hotline. And can you give us a little overview of like, what has been your journey with like, why did you start it first of all? What is the Body Hotline and why did you start it? Yeah, well, the Body Hotline in its original iteration is uh, an on-demand membership service for getting answers to your questions about pain, movement, exercise, and holistic health. Yeah. And I started it because um, I'm a multidisciplinary body worker and movement coach, which means I do a lot of things. I was first a massage therapist. I mean, I am still a massage therapist. Will I ever massage anyone ever again? I don't know, but <laughs> I still have all that knowledge and all those skills and experience. So massage therapist, then I became a yoga teacher and a yoga therapist, which is um, what I would describe as a specialized uh, form of, of individual yoga and uh, individual application of yoga. Um, and then I became a personal trainer. And all the while I've been doing my own things with my body, like kickboxing. I'm a cyclist. Um, I lift weights here and there. Uh, this past year, before we had to stop everything, I was uh, doing aerial silks uh, at a circus school. And that was really fun. fun. And I definitely miss that. So anyway, I have all these movement skills and tools and techniques 
and experiences. And so I wanted to come up with a way to um, put them all together so that when someone had a question, they could ask it to someone who might have an answer. Because so often we can't really call our, like we, we have a shoulder pain, we, can, we could maybe call our doctor, but so many of my peers anyway, don't have a relationship with a doctor. It's yeah. just the way it's come to be in, I think my generation. Um, well, not only that, but some questions about your body aren't for a medical doctor. Totally. And you don't really get to just call the PT. I mean, I think some people can somewhere, but not, not in New York. <laughs> it's like, well, unless with, you already have a relationship. With, right. And especially with the way, um, with the way our healthcare system is right exactly. now. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> really, that's its own Ugh. thing. So I definitely will refer someone to physical therapy if what we experiment with together does not work out. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah. I definitely, I definitely know my scope of practice and I uh, adhere to that. But there's so many things to try when you have a small pain, when you know what you did, but you don't know really what to do to fix it. Um, when, yeah, sometimes people just like over exercise. And the next step is not to stop exercising for two weeks. The next step is actually to, to um, thoughtfully build things back into your life. Like, don't right. stop moving. If something, <laughs> I was just going to generalize and say, don't stop moving. If something hurts, don't stop moving. However, stop moving, figure out what it is, and then move around some more. Right, right, right. In it's, short. It's, it's be a little bit more intentional with that mm -hmm. movement, you know. Mm -hmm. Does, um, okay, so the, the fun thing that is happening right now uh, is that this makes this, the recording of this episode so perfect uh, because we're talking about risk, define expectation, and Hannah Kyle is about ready to launch a brand new product um, called Five Minute Movement. Five minute movement. It's happening tomorrow. <laughs> okay, so here we are. We're at risk. You've yeah the effort. You've put in the you know you've done your work and you've done your market research and you've like built the sales pages and you've done the emails and you've got the the dominoes have been all set up. Um, how does it feel to do uh... something brave? <laughs> ah, that kind of sound like um tina on bob's burgers a little bit yep uh -huh. um, but i think that i don't need to be that afraid because i think that i don't want to regret saying this ever but i think that it's gonna go well um the model i have not been so excited about a, a model for a product in maybe my whole career um because this only takes five minutes. These are what I'm offering is five minute activities. And someone said to me today, like, you, there isn't really an excuse to just do five minutes. Like sometimes I don't have 10 minutes. I might not have want to spend 15 minutes, but there's no excuse for 15 for five minutes. And I was like, I'm so glad to hear that because that's what I think too. Yeah. 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 I, I, I think one of the things that has been really great, um, for me to see this unfold is that I think when you first joined the school, creating a project or product like this would have taken a lot more. Um, I, I just have, I have, I have noticed like, wow, she's building this thing. She's going for it. Well, like now that I don't have anything else I have to do outside of the house, it really of, makes a difference for this. Of course, of course. But I also think that there's a little bit of like you trusting that this is the, that you know what steps to do next and that you know, uh, you know how to put this thing together. I I have been learning over the past yeah. few years and I've been looking at other people's programs and I subscribe to other people's programs and I see what feels like it works for me and what doesn't. And a lot of this comes from, I think from my massage therapist um, knowledge base that when we, when we have aches and pains, um, they're, most like I can massage them out, but if you go back to doing what you were doing, 
before the massage, your body's just going to go back to the way it was before the massage because our bodies are really smart and they learn really quickly. Right. Now, the good news is that they can learn really quickly out of that habit into a new habit, but you have to, you have to go for it with the new habit. And that's what right. five minute movement is about. And it's about disrupting the habit primarily of sitting for a long time and it gets you moving for five minutes and then maybe you sit back down but your muscles just got a um i'm gesturing a squeezing a squeezing gesture with my hands when our muscles contract and release it moves the blood around moves our it moves all of the bodily fluids around the lymph all that which brings healing and oxygen and so everything is in better condition and there's less pain and more relief so you get up for five minutes, you do a thing, you sit back down and maybe, well, well then what can I say? It's different. Yeah. Yeah. Well, what I love about the five minute movement, I concept is that you have lowered risk for saying yes to participating. Um, nice. be, right. Because you, you've yeah. said like, you don't have to risk a lot to say yes to moving your body for five minutes. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> like it's just five minutes, but it, what you're saying is that those five minutes can make a big difference, especially if you're cooped up in your apartment. Mm -hmm. The stakes are low, but the return is high. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I have not felt, I might've said this already. I have not felt so excited about something like this in a long time. And I also, this requires me making videos uh, of myself doing these movements. And I, yeah, I don't I was know just, if I, I was about done ready, that. I, I was just about ready to ask you like, uh, what have been, you know, you're really excited about this, but this is also, uh, um, and just because you know how to put this together doesn't mean that there are, is still a learning curve involved in this. So, so what, much. Yeah, what have you, or what learning curve risks have you encountered? Um, investing in new pieces of equipment was, is a risk because I don't, I got a mic that connects to my phone for when I record. And I was like, is this the right choice? It's always, is this the right choice? Is this going to work? And it, mm -hmm. I think it does. I think it's fine. Um, let's see. <laughs> Making a recording of myself and then editing it. I don't do too much editing. I just cut the beginning and the end. And if I mess up in the middle, I stop and re-record. It's only five minutes, you know? Mm -hmm. But I'm editing the beginning and the end. I'm just like looking to make sure it's all what it's supposed to be. And um I've never spent <laughs> so much time analyzing this my gestures or what I do with my eyes when I'm talking. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, I've had to sort of let go of a lot of that. And I think that's really good as someone socialized as a female in this world to worry less about how I look and mm -hmm. have it be in service of the recipients. Like it doesn't really matter. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. So when you're building, so when you're doing something new like this, and or what has made it worthwhile to let go of that risk of like judging yourself or judging being judged by others and just like going for it and making the videos anyways hmm hmm i have not gotten a smidge of bad feedback yet mm -hmm. so I beta tested this program with about 15 people um, for three weeks in April. And um, I solicited feedback a number of times and I got a little bit of technical feedback, uh, like deliver the video a little bit earlier and that kind of thing. But mm -hmm. um, there was no, there was never anything about me. You know, it was never personal. It was always technical. And I think that, um, what makes it worth the risk for me is that I'm putting my genuine self on the camera mm -hmm. and encouraging everyone on the other end to show up as their genuine selves and that it, no one has to be a certain way to do this. I am 
feeling a little bit of dismay that I can't make this accessible for all humans, but I'm working on it. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, we were talking in our last master class about that, mm -hmm. like how, like, where is the place for inclusivity yep. as a business owner and how do you be defiantly expectate? how can you include defiant expectation in your business plan and in your like career goals um, when the rest of your industry or the rest of the world is saying that's not how it's done. Totally. Um, there is a direct um, non-correlation, <laughs> I think, <laughs> between inclusivity and uh, niching down sometimes mm. in my mind. So by being really super, super specific about who a product is for, to me that leaves out a lot of other people. And mm. I know that we've also talked about how it can, the, the lenses can vary and um, that's great because yeah. It can be hard. It can be hard, especially in the fitness industry where um, it's primarily dominated by able-bodied people who have pretty small bodies on the grand scheme of things. And I really don't want people to think that that's who my product is for, except yeah. for here I am, the only person on the video. So I'll let you in on a little secret and it's called Special Guest Saturdays. Oh. And on Saturdays, it's going to be a video from a special guest who is not me and comes from a wide variety of um, people in the world who See? make a five minute movement recording and then send it to me. And then uh, they get, then they're on the video. So, so I, I'm excited so about that. If you are a business owner or you're creative or you're somebody who's putting together something that is let's say that, that you really want it to have an element or a value represented that your industry doesn't really value or your, the way that things work is not that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, I like, this is a perfect example of that. Um, Hannah Kyle's five minute movement and the special guest Saturdays. Um, there, there's definitely creative ways that you can incorporate your values into these things that you're producing and putting out into the world. Um, it's just a matter of trying to figure out where is the appropriate place for them, you know? Absolutely. Um, so, and if you, if you want help, like, or have questions about that, Hannah Kyle or myself would be happy to answer any of those kinds of questions because both of us we nerded out on that at the end of our last <laughs> masterclass together. So, yeah. Yeah. What I think about and feel um, excited about with this is this idea that, um, it, well, the question of how can I leverage my privilege? And mm. so often I'm like, well, I don't actually have that big of an audience. So I don't have people banging down the door to, learn from me. Maybe I shouldn't say that so loud, but I have people who, who do learn from me, but I haven't, I haven't, you know, a hundred thousand followers or such. I'm mm -hmm. small. Um, but I can still leverage my privilege by providing a platform for other people and it doesn't have to be a big platform. Any platform counts. And so that's, right. that's the thing that I feel really, um, happy that I, that I figured out a way to do that for myself because I, I have not in the past. Right. And, um, when you're choosing to risk something like this, like build this brand new product or do the brand new thing. Um, I mean, one of the choices you already alluded to is that you've, you've chosen to not really edit this thing. Like you trim off the ends, but you're not really editing yep. every single word. Um, similarly, like with this podcast, we press record. Y'all are hearing all the ums <laughs> and the spaces and the me circling around to try to find the question I really want to ask and all that stuff. Like 
uh, and I'm doing that on purpose because I want to, you know, communicate that kind of vulnerability. But I also, it, you know, for me, it's much easier for me to just press record and then upload. <laughs> um, so as a business owner, that's also a systems decision, not also, not just a values decision. Um, but how have, like, how did you make that choice to edit or not? Because that was a risk. Well, I mean, I made that decision because I'm not a video editor and I have firmly believed for many years that that a person like me can be an expert in only so many realms. Mm. And really, it'd be cool if it was just one big one. Um, I'm a little bit of a generalist, but not so much. And I don't wanna learn how to do graphic design and I don't wanna learn how to be a video editor because if I wanted to learn, I went to Emerson College, we had a, we have, there's huge film production, audio production. Like if I wanted to go into that, I would have, mm -hmm. but, I, but I don't. And so I was like, how can I make this as simple as possible? I don't need to, it to be any fancier than one shot. Yeah. Yeah. So using your, so your choice to risk edit, I guess, risking perfection, I guess is what mm -hmm. you're risking yeah. was based around your skill, your current skills or lack mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. Because if I'm spending a bunch of time editing, then that just, it just takes longer for the content to get to the people. And assuming the people want the content, assuming that people find the content useful, why delay it? Right. Right. Because our bravery is needed, it's worth it, and it's contagious. Mm -hmm. yeah. Also, yeah. perfection is overrated. I don't know. There's a lot of little phrases we could say. Progress over perfection, things like that. Yep, exactly. that I've heard and heard over the years and I'm continuing to remind myself. Yeah. Well, I would, I would say that if you are listening to this and you would, are interested in moving your body five minutes a day, then you should go check out the body hotline and go subscribe to five minute movement with Hannah Kyle, because it's, it's going to be good. Um, I've been, I've been hearing all the all the back end like <laughs> technical things and we've been we've been making improvements and tweaks and things like that and it's always fun to see new products get rolled out or new projects get rolled out um for me just i enjoy seeing that process um because it's not a like you wake up and, and ta-da this perfect you know like perfection not at exists, all exists on a platter like no <laughs> i really enjoy the that process of molding and mushing and you know like oh let's stick this thing over here and put it over on that side and that's why the school of bravery is such a good place to be yeah yeah well um we're gonna put links to hannah kyle's stuff everything yep. the the room and discount orchestra. and oh, discount and for the subscription discount. of course yay that's a that's fun so discounts, links, all the good stuff is going to be in the show notes for the episode. So please come over to the school bravery.com forward slash podcast and check that out. And if you have a question for myself or Hannah Kyle or any other students or guest faculty, you can um, leave a voicemail for us at that spot on just forward slash podcast schoolofbravery.com forward slash podcast. There's a big button that says, leave us a voicemail. Um, I am so grateful that you joined us today, Hannah Kyle. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me, Emily Ann. Yeah, you're welcome. You're welcome.